um, I'm going to suggest we get going and, and start rolling this thing out. And I'd just like to say uh, good afternoon to everybody and thank you for joining us. We're, I know the participant list will sort of grow as we move along here. Uh, but this is uh, Cycling Canada's inaugural web uh, chat series, and it's, it's called Cycling Chats, uh, presented by Apex, uh, a payment and risk management solutions company that's a brand new sponsor for Cycling Canada. We're very, very excited about that. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, although we got some palmaries up on, on the screen next to us here in these, in these videos, my name is Kurt Harnett. Um, I am a four-time Olympian uh, in track cycling, uh, but most of you know me more for my uh, shampoo commercial uh, per plus. And as you could tell from me right now, I am uh, working hard on regaining that, uh, that sponsorship deal with my COVID hair and beard. <laughs> uh, joining us today, uh, I think our people that require uh, limited, if, if any, uh, introduction, but thought I'd uh, do uh, them some, some, some honors of just giving and pointing out some, some really nice elements. Joining us from Dundas, Ontario, is uh, Leah Kirchman. Uh, Leah, of course, uh, has set the world on fire, uh, Olympian in, in 2016, but uh, really well known for her ITT exploits. I think Canada Cycling just did something, uh, Cycling Magazine just did a, a, a post where they said, name that rider, and it was a mountain bike shot from a uh, a Canada Cup series somewhere, and uh, cross country skier turned mountain biker, natural progression, then to road cycling, and somehow, of course, taking that mountain bike prowess, uh, individual time trialing, and translating it so well to the road world champion Triple T 2017 individual time trial, uh, fourth place, I think it was uh, in Innsbruck, an amazing performance there, kept that kept us on the edge of our seat. Um, Alex Stita, again, an individual that requires limited introduction. Um, calls himself a lifelong cyclist of all stripes, which I think couldn't be more true. Uh, uh, his uh, pièce de résistance in the cycling world is the claim of being North America's first ever uh, cyclist to wear the yellow jersey at the famed Tour de France. If I'm not mistaken, Alex, you had all five classifications on that day. You took them well, all. There were five jerseys uh, that I won, but the green jersey was one I didn't win because they had some other jerseys that they don't have anymore. So it's a little complicated. I don't like complication, so we'll keep it. Easy. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, one of the great things you've done is, of course, showing your your handyman skills uh, through Instagram. As and I forgot to mention, Leah with her Instagram posts on some of those great culinary uh, treats that she's been posting, helping us make our way through this this pandemic. You, of course, not only that amazing riding platform that you. Uh, that you built, but uh, but also uh, the the fence pulling. Uh, that was one night you had me on the edge of the seat uh, <laughs> with with that one. And uh, he's joining. Alex is joining us from Edmonton, and all the way from Andorra, Spain. We're we're blessed to have Michael Rusty Woods uh, joining us. Uh, of course, Rusty um, taking the world cycling world by storm uh, in the mid two uh, thousands, uh, turning uh, or late uh, late twenties. Uh, early 20s, early late 10s, somewhere in that era, whatever we call those, the, the decade now, but, uh, you know, famous for transforming himself as a middle distance runner into a world-class cyclist, bronze medal at the 2018 World Championships. Of course, the first medal that we saw in men's road cycling since 1984 in the great Steve Bauer. Um, of course, Michael taking full advantage of uh, this COVID break uh, unfortunately, having broken his leg earlier this year, um, sort of this blessing in disguise, uh, giving you the chance. Uh, Michael, spend a little time at home with uh, Ellie and uh, your new daughter, Max. So I got to imagine, I don't want to say it, uh, maybe a blessing in disguise uh, to have that time with your daughter. Totally. Uh, I wouldn't even say disguise, it's just a blessing. Yeah, sorry. I. You know, sometimes uh, I'll throw <laughs> that I didn't mean to say. So please don't hold me, hold me to to the oh, no, 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 on that stuff. But you know, like uh, you know, we talked about Leah's and her transgression, her transformation from a cross country skier to mountain biker to road cyclist. I think the three of us, Alex and uh, Mike and myself, share the the journey of the you know wanting to be NHL hockey players and slowly transforming ourselves into for various reasons into uh into cyclists you guys world class cyclists me just a 
just a bit player on the on the scene. But you know, we thought we'd start this particular series with um, you know, the the inaugural uh, webinar with this discussion of sort of this evolution of road cycling. Um, I've always had this viewpoint that we're all sort of in the fundamentals at the core. We're all road bikers. We're all road cyclists, and we've sort of seen this. The, you know, we sort of find, you know, at, at our core, it, it seems like road cycling is at its core. Um, I went on to be a track cyclist. You know, Leah went from mountain biking to, to road cycling, probably used the road bike as a way to stay in shape uh, to help her with her mountain biking. Alex, you know, hockey and cycling and using, uh, using the bike to deliver papers as a kid, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we've all spent time on the road. And really, I think the exciting thing here is, is taking a look at what's happening out there in the in the road uh, in the road cycling environment, and having this discussion, I you know I can't help Alex but look back and say, uh, you know your experiences, first North American team ever to show up at the Tour de France, you know all of those elements there of of what that looked like to what we see present day. And I hope to have this amazing broad discussion of that. But let's reflect back, like think about your first foray into Europe and you're, you know, you're taking on, you know, that you're these new kids on the block and everybody's like, who are these guys? These, you know, uh, like speak about that a little bit, what that meant. What was that like? Well, I'll have to go back to uh, my amateur days. Um, I started, I started road cycling, but the, the first racing I did was road cycling in 77 in, in the Vancouver areas where I grew up. And uh, you know, I was super fortunate to have a core group of of, of uh, hardcore road cyclists in Vancouver at the time, including Ron Heyman and Roger Sumner. Uh, some of you guys might, some people might remember both those names. Ron's still in Penticton. Roger, unfortunately, passed away. Um, but you know, th that <clears throat> excuse me, that 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 core group was really um, you know helped steer my trajectory. And if it hadn't been for the, for those uh, key guys and the juniors that I raced with, Bruce Spicer, Brian Green, Corning Sinclair, Neil Davies. You know, if it hadn't been for that core group of guys, you know, accepting me into their group and teaching me how to shave my legs, you know, the first time, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, but my first foray into Europe was, you know, Ron Heyman in 19, <clears throat> excuse me, fall of 1980, sat me down with Roger Sumner and said, you need to go to Europe and, and learn how to race properly. So I was like, all right, fine. And so he he sent a letter, no emails back then, of course, to his friend Luke Eisermans in Ghent. And I just arrived there on a D&D &D flight to Lar and then took the train, first trip to Europe, no credit card, no cell phone, and uh, ended up in Ghent for two months, racing Kermes for uh, for two months. And it was uh, it was eye-opening, let me tell you. But, it you know, it, that – the the – the role the national program played in that, well, they connected me with a D&D &D flight, and I, so I flew for free from Ottawa to LAR. And that was the extent of the national program helping me. <laughs> See, it, it, it's, you know, and again, it's, it, you know, respecting it's a, it's a different era, and, and to us, you know, again, I, I always sort of reflect back on, you, you spoke about, you didn't send emails, you sent mail, and you know, those those great British cycling magazines that would show up six weeks after with all of the results of all of the European racing and, and some amazing things like that. But Leah, like reflect on your transition, reflect on, you know, give us a sense of what, you know, what was your experience? And I, I you know, whether it was to go to Europe or, you know, your foray from being a local cyclist to a provincial level to national level, and then, you know, of course, international, I, you know, let's, let's reflect on that a little bit. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think my experience is a, a little bit different hearing Alex's story. Um, I guess, yeah, jumping straight to um, transitioning a bit to Europe was my, my support from the national team was a little bit more than just a, a paid flight. Um, yeah, when I first started going over in, I think it was around 2010, then they actually had, you know, organized national team programs and we would go over supported for, for a full month of racing. And that's really where I, I started getting that exposure to the international scene. And yeah, we'd go with, we'd get that support. So have staff from Canada and mechanics, Swinger and 
Canadian teammates and, you know, get to race in the biggest classics. And I think that definitely played a big role in where I am now because as, uh, yeah, Alex and Mike know and, and Kurt, you, that racing in Europe is, is a whole different game and you only get better at it the more that you do it. So it was this time with the national team just going there every year and these opportunities that, that allowed me to develop those skills over time. Now, Mike, same thing with you, I guess, is is this idea. I mean, uh, the support mechanism, the, the the worldly nature of the sport, maybe some of these things have transitioned and, you know, the, certainly the internet, you know, the, has provided us the, the access to details and and just quite frankly, you know, the the leadership of, of athletes like Alex heading overseas, uh, you know, take on the great beast of European cycling, um, you know, is, are, you know, are your your experiences more consistent with, with Leah versus Alex or, or somewhere in between? I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was really fortunate in the sense that I started cycling so late, but hearing... Alex's stories gave me flashbacks to my first time over to Europe as a runner. Like, it's crazy how things have changed in even 15 years. The first time I came over to Europe as a runner, you know, it wasn't as extreme as Alex, but yeah, you're reading magazines, running track, track magazines, and coming over with just a phone card uh, and uh, a hope and a prayer, like not knowing anybody. And really, it's like now the internet uh, has made it so much more accessible and so much easier to get over there. and. I uh, fast forward to when I first went over for uh, in 2014 uh, to race for an Italian team in Italy, and I had a lot more clarity as to what was going on. It was still a terrible situation. It was still crazy. It was still an awful Italian apartment with a uh, corrupt Italian team and terrible infrastructure and a bunch of lies. But uh, it was uh, yeah, I, had, I was able to at least call home and FaceTime a couple times and and. Uh, and, and I just complained to my family. Rule number five, it teaches you pretty fast, isn't it? The Villanati rule, harden the F up. It, it, you know, and, and that's, you know, maybe one of those things we talk about <laughs> and, and maybe what we're looking at today. I, again, uh, you know, I grew up on the road scene. Many people don't know that I was actually jun junior national road champion back in 82. Uh, won the field sprint over the mighty Kohan, the Kojan brothers from, from Quebec. In a in a devastating sprint finish that I had, it was quite amazing. I got pushed up the last the last hill before the sprint finish, but that's another story. Uh, but you know, my days racing the you know, the Belgian Club Criterium, uh, the Tour of Manitoba, you know, the Winnipeg racing, the needing to try, you know, hop in a van with my father on a Friday afternoon and drive, uh, you know, eight hours minimum someplace to get some racing in. Uh, you know, are we seeing that? Have you guys seen that now on the local scene, on the Canadian scene? That sort of that that same inspiration of you know we got to do get this kid out there, do what it takes. Um, you know, maybe Leah and, and Mike, you guys are you know you're not so grounded in in what's happening in the local scene, or not? And maybe you are, and, and and feel free to pipe in. But Alex, like I mean, you know, you're the board member of the great uh, Edmonton Juventus Club, Juventus Club. Um, you know, uh, are we seeing that like this this real grassroots racing uh, initiative that that made you guys such great cyclists? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say yes and no. I mean, uh, it's harder and harder for clubs, you know, in, in the Edmonton area, and I hear you know nationwide here. It's a problem is is getting access to roads to close roads to run local races, club club events. Um, so it, it's it's tough. Uh, but we do see lots of young kids getting interested in, in cycling and, and, and bike racing. We have a great junior program here at Juventus. We, we start kids from 8 to 10-year-old with a Sprock Kids program, similar to iRide in BC. And then we have what they call the Lorianne Munzer program for 11 to 14-year-olds, where I, I help coach and we develop skills and then introduce them to racing. And then if they want to race, go into uh, into our junior program. But you know, I'm, I'm a little reticent to say it, but it, I, you know, I, you know, I think I'll, you know, you, Kurt, you and I, you came from that kind of school of hard knocks, same as you, would be, you know. But you know, I think the kids these days, they, they're not as willing to sacrifice 
I, maybe I'm sounding old, <laughs> but you know, they're, they're, they just don't seem to want to go, you know, and put themselves out there. You know, it's like, oh, and it, and I, and that's a little frustrating to me to see. Michael, what about you? Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think going on that point, uh, I was really lucky to be a product of a great cycling scene in Ottawa. Uh, when I, like, it's not like I, I've been at this for, for decades, but I, it's it's been pretty extreme to see the change that's happened in the Ottawa area since I started. When I was when I started, there was a great network of um, group rides. There were several uh, races within a very easy drive of Ottawa. Um, we had the OBC Grand Prix. We had several other races um, and a lot of great racing in Quebec and even in the. Um, uh, North, northeast of uh, the United States. Since in the last 10 years, it's really, those races have really started to fade away. Um, you see them being replaced by Grand Fondos. Uh, you see, um, like in Ottawa, for example, our cyclocross series being expanded, uh, being banned within parks within the actual city. Uh, and yeah, there's been a bit of an atrophying of the sport, making it a bit, I think, I think a lot less accessible and I think that's one of the reasons why Alex brings up the point you don't see these guys who are willing to get the shit in their teeth because they're starting and uh, they're, you don't have that same level of access. You don't have the same number of people doing it. And often it's kids who are a lot more privileged getting into the sport. And because they're so privileged, parents are able to pay for them to get over Europe. Parents are able to pay for them to do races across the country. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does – often make you a bit softer. Like you look at the look at a lot of the European uh, programs and their uh, cycling is still a lot more blue collar. Uh, it's a lot more accessible. Uh, the clubs are so significant throughout these countries that you don't have to have mom and dad pay your way to make it into cycling. And cycling is such a hard sport that you can't you just can't be soft. You have to make in some in some instances you have to work to get there. Um, and I, I mean, it's not like I, I'm, I, I was a poor kid. I had great parents, I have great parents that helped, helped me, that my dad bought me a bike, uh, and that enabled me to get into bike ra racing. But uh, you still need to have to, there needs to be a degree of almost earning it, working for that. And when you take away the, when you create more barriers to access, you eliminate that, that those people that, you eliminate a lot of people that are willing to work hard for, uh, and I'm sure, again, getting like, over some to people maybe are going to sort of pipe in in the chat room or otherwise, and maybe that, that you know, oh, I, I, we know that there's this kid out there that's got the grit, that's got the, you know, the potential, and, and you know, how do we make, you know, where, how do we work that pathway for that child? So we're not saying that everybody doesn't have the grit or the, the, the shit in their teeth, <clears> like you, you, you said, Michael. Uh, it's one of those things where, um, you know, it 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 it, it kind of maybe happens in a in a or it's happening uh, the opposite is happening where we're maybe not seeing enough of that. Leah, what about you? What you know was what what is your experience like? Yeah, it's interesting uh, reflecting back on the the Manitoba scene, um, and also hearing your your experience with it like um, even further back. Um, yeah, I think it's grown a lot from what I've. I've seen since I was part of the program and it's changed um, in a good way. Um, you know, it was pretty small and I had, um, if any of you know, Marion Pizczek was my, my first uh, cycling coach and really got me on the road. And um, we had quite a, a small group of us that, that trained together, like maybe, I don't know, five or a bit more, but he really cared about giving us opportunities and um, making it accessible. So he was always like piecing together bikes from parts in the basement and we would drive like three days to get to races in the US or to drive to Saskatchewan or drive to Quebec. Um, so there's definitely like that, um, that effort to make it accessible and, and to give us the best chance at, at learning and growing as riders. Um, and it, yeah, what I see now is that it's great to see that that program's expanded to um, have a more 
clear development pathway. So from I also started from Kids in Mud, which is like a great grassroots kids program. So you can start with a, a bigger base of riders. And then within the provincial program, um, now uh, Jay Gillespie's taking it over, or he, he started 2009, I believe. And they have, you know, different levels. And I'm seeing riders are being connected and going out to, to bigger teams. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that the, the whole kind of system is growing out of Manitoba. You know, we're talking, you know, again, again, the premise of this particular webinar is, is about evolution. And one of the bigger evolutionary aspects of the sport is the actual equipment. Right. And, and Michael, you, you know, Rusty, you sort of touched on this a little bit about, you know, the idea of privilege. Are we pricing ourselves out of the game here? Is this, is, is technology overtaking, uh, the fundamentals of what the sport should be? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, I think it's, you know, bikes are so good now. It's insane. Like, uh, and I, I noticed that when I'm racing, uh, I, I'll do, if I do a local group ride and I'm not on race wheels, I suffer. Like it, it, there, there's a huge, uh, technological gap now, uh, so much so that, um, it means, uh, miss spots for qualifications for juniors in some instances. It means, you know, uh, a, a, a race win that didn't happen. And like, I reflect back on my running career and as a kid, uh, when, because I started winning, that inspired me more to train, that, to train harder, to work harder. Um, and, uh, like if you're, you know, showing up at races and, you know, losing them because, you're not on the fastest race wheels on a, and a carbon bike uh, and, you know, a, a wind tunnel test. Uh, that's, I don't know if that's, that, that, that's not necessarily a good way to um, develop the sport. I think we need to focus, I think as Canadians in particular, on how can we make it more accessible. Maybe, I'm not necessarily saying put limitations on equipment, but I don't know, maybe that is the solution. I, I just think... Um, <coughs> Cycling in Canada would be so much stronger if everybody that wanted to get into it had access to a pretty entry-level bike and wasn't limited by that bike. Well, maybe I could jump in there. Um, Ron Heyman runs the Heyman Classic in, in uh, Penticton. for It's a race for juniors, stage race for juniors. And it's been frustrating. We've sent teams there from our Juventus Club uh, to participate in his, in his stage race. <clears throat> but... Every year, the rules change around what equipment is allowed because one province allows, I don't know, 42 millimeter carbon rims. Another province says, no, we only have, we only allow 20 millimeter carbon rims. So a week before the race, the rules change and they have to allow 40 millimeter carbon rims because Ontario is coming. Right? There's, that's even in the last few years. Um, so there needs to be more leadership. I'm just going to say it, more leadership from Cycling Canada around what is allowed and how to control this, you know, I don't know, technology. I don't know what, uh, what the word, the right word is, but, um, I mean, we could call it privilege. You know, the, the people that can afford it. Can have a faster bike, and Woodsy, you're dead on. It, it's it's not right, and we we've got to focus on developing these young athletes from you know in that you know the U15, U17 age group, and then maybe they can go to junior worlds. But you know to but you got to try somehow try to make it a level playing field, and it's uh it's it's definitely um. Uh, a situation that needs to more that needs more attention from Cycling Canada. In my mind, yeah, it's Cycling Canada, and it's also um, the private industry as well. I remember I was working at the running room at one point, and Nike came in and they did a talk on racing spikes, and they realized that um, spikes like running shoes, like these high-end uh, racing shoes, 
are lost leaders. Like they, they, they actually lose money on their spikes, but they recognize that cross country and track and field in Ontario and all, like across the board, Canada and also in the United States are major uh, arter, major feeder systems for people that are eventually going to be uh, recreators for life. And so they see these kids coming in and they go, okay, uh, let's make Nike the leader in making accessible, really high-end race shoes. And it's like almost like the Happy Meal. They've got them addicted to Nike, the Nike branch that when they're older, they're willing to spend two, $300 on a pair of Nike shoes because that's what they raced in when they were kids. And it would be amazing if we could create some type of program with bike sponsors within Canada where, you know, that a company is that forward thinking. We're like, so let's be the leader in getting more juniors on bikes. Let's get them on, you know, a nice bike and see our brand as being what they want to ride for life. Yeah, I, I think that there's a, uh, you know, there's, I, I, I sort of reflected back a little bit earlier on, a, on, a, you know, situation. I, I was racing the Belgian Club criteria. I think I mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, but I was, a, I was a junior rider, and they allowed me to race in the senior race. So I rode the junior race, the joint, the junior crit. I won that. And what I had to do was during the, t the break between the two races, I had to change my back wheel. So I had restricted gearings and I went out into the senior race and actually ended up winning the, the senior ride as well. I think my first prize was a, uh, a, a year membership at the local health club in Winnipeg, which of course I, I know was never able to use being from Thunder Bay. But there is this idea of equipment and, you know, uh, you know, are we, chasing too much of that there's the concept of and again we're, i've been sort of looking through the chat line uh, the chat room a little bit you know the idea are we over specializing too early uh, what is you know how are we building you know the events and you know alex in the you know again with the limit of time here want to talk about the tour of alberta and you know the status of of quite frankly racing in canada u.s in general that's a conversation all of us all three of you guys uh, can have uh, and, and pipe in on. So it's like these, there's these little pieces and, you know, it's so funny. You go to an old velodrome in, in Europe, you know, that's been around since the ninth, you know, the early 1900s. And, you know, they'll have an old bike there from 1906 on the wall. And you'll say like, you see, you sort of put the new bike up, you know, a 2020 bike up against that. And it's like, actually, you know, kind of, Apart from some technological advances and you know the the the, the material that the bike is made of, kind of looks the same, right? There, there, there's there's not much of a difference yet. We know deep down inside the the you know the the difference. I remember riding my first carbon fiber bike in you know early 2000 and going like, where the hell was this when I was racing? Uh, but you know, like, what are your thoughts on you know over specialization? We've all come from somewhere. We came from a sport. That then brought us into an into cycling. Like, share some thoughts on that, and I'll open it up like, to whoever wants to take the lead. Leah, those other guys talk. I, you, you I can, yeah, I can. <laughs> I can take the lead because I, yeah, I think I'm a good example of someone who uh, didn't specialize very early. Since I, I did start as a cross country skier, and then yeah, I took up mountain biking at 13, rode at 15, and I did all of those sports until I was 20 and then specialized in the road. And um, yeah, reflecting on that, I think that's what set me up for such a long and successful career is because I think I gained, I was just so active in so many different ways that I really trained my body to um, be quite balanced and healthy um, compared to if I had only cycled since I was 10 years old, then I'd probably have a lot more, you know, imbalances and, and issues, or, or maybe I would have already, you know, burned out on the sport or moved on to other things. Um, yeah, so just, just personally, I really support, you know, keeping young kids in as many activities as possible, especially in Canada. You know, it's, it's hard to get the same kind of riding hours in during the winter months, so it's even more important that you know, maybe kids are introduced to these winter sports that can make up that deficit that maybe kids in other countries don't have. So that would be me, my opinion on it. 
Yeah, and uh, I'd agree. Uh, you know, playing other sports is 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 key, and you know, complementary sports. Let's say you know where you need aerobic power. So you know, cross country skiing, another one. I I'm uh, recently taken up skimo, ski mountaineering, and you know, in Europe it's huge, and there's all sorts of youth that are into schema. And Mike, you're nodding your head, uh, especially in Andorra, man. You're like right next to, you know, schema, schema nirvana. I know I talked to Swain about that. It's the, it's the next. Yeah. And that, you know, over here it's, it's not as big, but, you know, it, the, um, the idea of doing complementary sports, I think, is crucial in that U15, U17 range. Um, and I, it's unfortunate because I think a lot of there's a lot of kids that are so focused on on cycling since they're you know when they're when they start you know start the sport at say 13 14. Um, I often I often think about you know how many <clears throat> excuse me again how many junior world champions uh, turn you know are are pro and and people that we know okay Peter Sagan's one. But yeah, list is not that yeah, long. Yeah, Greg yeah. Lamont's another. Is not, uh, long. not many others. Mike, yeah, I mean, come on, you, you know, again, yeah. probably now the more storied uh, crossover athletes, and you know, speak about that. Like, speak about what the running provided for you as a foundation for your cycling. I think, the, yeah, the running provided invaluable tools. Um, but also just all the other sports that my parents put me in. Uh, I was so lucky as a kid to have these great parents that just threw me in anything. <laughs> uh, I mean, I had tons of energy, and so a lot of time they're just trying to burn me out. But they put me in everything, and because I was doing all these different sports, um, particularly uh, downhill skiing and hockey, um, you start. Uh, I think those sports. I've seen a lot of other runners try and make the transition into. Uh, becoming a cyclist and and really and not not succeeding and um, because that's mainly because running focuses less on the athleticism uh, that's necessary particularly in Europe when you come over to Europe it's less evident when you're racing in Canada and North America but when you go over to Europe it, it's a real high skill sport and the 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 fact that I was able to do all these other sports as a kid once I came over to Europe, I was really able to link them. I started, you know, thinking about when I was a hockey player and, and, and working uh, in tight spaces uh, and always trying to be aware of where your competition is. That's essentially being in a peloton on a small road in Europe. Downhill skiing, thinking about cornering, where my weight was through the skis, uh, how I was going to read the line, that's descending. And uh, if it were not for just this range of sports that I did as a kid, there's no way I could have made that transition uh, from running to cycling. Uh, and then, yeah, obviously as a runner, um, there were great lessons that I learned there that, that, that you know, are the reason why I'm having success today. And uh, I got into the sport at 25. So uh, this idea that you have, like, uh, this idea of loading pressure onto a kid who's 17 and making them think that they could never be pro unless – you know, they qualify for the World Junior Championships or they don't place well at a U23 race is false. You can still make it. Uh, it's a bit more difficult, but, um, yeah, I, I think it's foolish to, to just focus on this one discipline from a really early age. Uh, gives you, it means you yeah, are going to lose perspective. You're right, for well. some it's going to I mean, keep amazing you learning a lot about the great in, things. In many facets, of course, you know, with the strong – men's, women's programs, you know, the, the development programs. Um, do you talk, like, like what are some of the experiences that some of your teammates have that have come, that are part of the team? Like, do you guys talk about that? Like, where did you guys come from? What are you doing? You know, what got you here? Can you reflect on that a little bit? Maybe a bit of a surprise question, I'm sorry, but, like, your teammates, like, what about, you know, what about them? Like, what are we seeing from other people from around the world? Um, yeah, it's really interesting, actually, I can, and I can kind of compare Senwev's approach with my experience on North American teams, because I think you do see a bit of a difference with a lot of how North Americans get into the sport and then Europeans, where it, it does seem to be older athletes getting into it, 
maybe people find it after college in in uh, North America, where they'll start much younger in Europe. Um, and the Sunweb, especially if you if you look at the roster, um, it's it's quite a young team. I feel <laughs> you're quite old on the team, um, but that is the the model that they they choose, and and they do target. Um, you know, getting athletes quite young and then developing them within the program. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, you know, a, a lot of my teammates, European teammates, have been cycling for, for quite a long time. Um, and that's been their, their main sport. Um, but, yeah, I can think there's, there's a few other examples of coming from other sports. Um, you know, like there's a judo player on my team, a downhill skier, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, yeah, you can find countless examples of, of people developing through different sports or, or using those to complement their cycling. I mean, there's, uh, you know, we, uh, we have a great example. I mean, it seems like cycling is a great second generation. I don't know, uh, you know, second sport uh, that, that as you age, you know, all the, all the play that you had in hockey and soccer and, you know, all the other, other sports is this idea of, you know, that, you know, athletes can transition out of that and leverage all of that physical, you know, uh, core ability that they've built and translate that into, into the bike. The bike accepts that very well. We've had, you know, there's a great program running in Canada now called RBC Training Ground that is, you know, that has found a couple of great athletes for us. Um, uh, the latest, Kelsey Mitchell, who is, you know, uh, been in the been on the bike for just over two years. A soccer former soccer player come over to to cycling, and you know, is the current world record holder in the women's two hundred meter time trial. I mean, just an uber talent. Um, you know, is there is there ways that you know, again, based off your opinions, are we seeing it in other countries, seeing other opportunities, looking, exploring, finding these these athletes out there? I mean, do we see any, you guys have any great thoughts on, on that? Any, any ideas on that, what we should be looking for? Well, I think in looking over Europe, um, in many ways, Canada, we do do a great job in, in being a bit more creative because we have to be. The racing scene's not as significant. Um, we don't have that those week in week out local races that kids can just show up to like you do in Italy, for example. Um, but in, so in Canada, we have to, like I said, be creative. And that, that's why there's like a program like RBC is, is great in terms of identifying talent. Uh, and I think we just need to continue being creative until we are able to create some type of infrastructure where, you know, we have really accessible races to a wide range of kids. Um, yeah, I think I think we're actually not doing a bad job in terms of doing that talent identification. Yeah, I think that's um, sure. I'll jump in. You know what, what I ride is doing in BC is um, is fantastic. The, uh, the they've they've taken the evolution. You know, they've sort of said I think you know we want to get more kids on bikes, and there's a you know the school based program. Schools sign up, and and uh, you know a leader comes and and starts walking these kids through a skill session, and that generates interest. That's what starts them interested in you know getting them interested in cycling, in one way or another. <clears throat> so, you know th that those kinds of programs they're more systematic, uh, as I put in the comments, um, need to be enabled across the country. I know it, it's a huge it's a huge lift, but. There, there needs to be less re reliance on individual people who have the experience. And, you know, I, I'm one of those. I love putting back into the sport. People helped me for no charge when I was young, and I, I'm doing the same thing now. But, you know, I'm not going to be here forever, and it's just me, you know, and, and I'm trying to share my methodologies with the people in the club. But there needs to be more of a, again, like I said, a systematic approach across the country that can sort of be consistent so parents can see that there's a, a program that they can put their kids into. And it's really more about, as, as Woodsy said, your parents threw you in. Okay, great. But I think now more, and ever, more than ever, parents are looking for programs to put their kids into, not just, oh, here, try this. They want to see that there's a track that their kids can follow. Yeah, and I think that is the challenge of, of Canada. It's, it's 
such a big country and we're so separate and, and all the provinces are operating uh, independently. And But yeah, I agree that some kind of program could uh, draw more numbers in. And just one thing I would like people to think about, or, or if we had a program like that, is I just see like how can we um, give younger riders the skills that they need to learn and succeed in Europe earlier on? Is there ways that we can teach that already in Canada so that when they're going to transition, then how can we make that transition easier so that it's not just a, a total shock when it happens? The, uh, you know, I, I, uh, just touching on a couple of points and, and uh, some people may or may not know this, but I sit on the board of Cycling Canada. One of the exciting things that is happening is that we're rolling out iRide across Canada in the next couple of years. And it is because of the success of the iRide program, as Kevin Field pointed in the chat room here, you know, they put 11,000 kids through their program, um, teaching them the skills, making them not, you know, not lifelong cyclists or not, I mean, not world champion cyclists, but lifelong cyclists. And, and uh, you know, me, I see the, you know, today's World Bicycle Day. I see the, the bicycle as a vehicle, as a, as, a, as a form of transportation, as much as a way to, to have tested my limitations and exceeded my expectations of myself and test myself on a daily basis. And it's, you know, it's, it's getting them at a time where they can, they can learn the skill set so that they're comfortable. I, I live in Toronto. Riding on the streets of Toronto are not that great. Um, especially as a young kid. My daughter, we tried a couple of times to ride to school, and I felt like I was in a Kieran race uh, over in Japan, for crying out loud, because I had, and I had to protect my daughter from other cyclists, not even just the cars, right? It's, 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 a, it's crazy. We're seeing a bike boom now. Uh, you know, the stores are telling us right now, you want to buy a bike for under $2,000 next to impossible. Uh, they, and they're not expecting a, the, the, the manufacturers not expecting getting more bikes on the ground here in, in, in Canada, you know, in months. Do you, I'm going to throw this one out there is like, like, do you see this as an opportunity for the sport? I mean, we've seen, you know, this pandemic has transformed us mentally in so many ways. Uh, the bike boom has been, you know, is, is certified. It's there. Um, Let's explore that. I mean, we're running on time. We want to get some questions here, maybe give some people an opportunity to ask some questions. But, but uh, uh, you know, let's explore that a little bit. Do, do, do we see that translation happening easier? The wider we build the foundation, the taller we can build the building? Was I not clear um, on that? Was that a yeah. problem? <laughs> I, think, I, I think think sort of finished off. Yeah. Huge. No, no, I think there's huge... And just, I guess, one yeah. comment I have is, you, no, no, you see, I think there's more open, open-mindedness about, yeah, just a, with having more people on bikes and more people seeing the value of, of active transport options. And, you know, we're seeing city streets are being shut down for cycling and runners. And maybe this is opening up that, that change that we need to see. Um, you know, to have better infrastructure and more cycling in Canada. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, like, especially in, as competitive cyclists, I think this is a real opportunity to kind of lead and promote that change. Um, because what's really important, and like, I was actually talking about this earlier today on another po on, a, on another podcast about how as a runner, run, run, when I was a runner, running was dead. It, 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 like compared to what it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was effectively dead. And uh, there was a point in around the early 80s where running is, was very similar to what cycling is today. Running had this burgeoning uh, mass participation event scene where you had like, uh, like London Marathon, New York Marathon, Boston, all these marathons growing. And, coming to prevalence and you have all these people doing it and then you had big stars of the sport you had uh guys like sebco and carl lewis um and track and running never really figured out a way to connect the two and eventually you fast forward to 2020 you still have you have these massive participation events where all these people are doing it but you 90 percent of the people that do the boston marathon couldn't tell you the guy the name of the guy that won it and so I think this is a real opportunity now in cycling, particularly as leaders in, in the sport here in Canada, 
to really promote what cycling can be and try and make that link to these mass participation events, which are, you know, the grand fondos that are going, like you have the Whistler Fondo, Vancouver Fondo, you have uh, all these other great gravel scene races that are popping up. How can we connect with that and uh, show that there is a link between the two? Um, if we're able to do that, then we'll be able to leverage the success that the bike industry is having right now. If we aren't, then it's going to we're probably going to end up the same way track and field would be what it is today. Uh, not a niche, a really niche sport with dwindling uh, Alex, you got anything there? Uh, fans and uh, TV time. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I would say I, I have to sign off here in a few minutes, but I would say, you know, cycling's in a very unique situation because we have so many different aspects of cycling that that people can get involved with right whether it's mountain road track gravel um, etc uh, and and so there's there's lots of ways for 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 youth to get engaged for uh, for programs to be built that can help um, you know keep people interested keep uh, keep, well, especially youth and their parents interested in the sport. We're very fortunate to have a velodrome here in Edmonton uh, that was built for the uh, for the 76 Commonwealth Games, and we make use of that velodrome, uh, you know, with our youth program, so kids can learn how to ride track, road, mountain, uh, cyclocross, and I think that's a, that's really important. We've created this bit of a, a system, you know, within our club. And I think, you know, we're, we're looking forward to, uh, to bringing iRide on, on board. You know, the question was, well, how many, how many kids who are in iRide end up being bike racers? Uh, great question. Um, Andrew said that maybe not many, but I, I think, you know, the, the problem is we, have, we also have to have opportunities for them to be bike racers. And, you know, if, if, there's, if there's no regular racing, then skills are great, but how are you gonna, how are they gonna translate? Like in Italy, you know, with the, you know, I think I was been following uh, Roberto Gaggioli on Instagram and his, his kid, his son is like in bike, road bike, bike races for like 10 year olds, like every week, right? It's, it's crazy. Now, maybe we don't get there with that, with that type of program, but, you know, I think there needs to we need to create these opportunities somehow, and and, and it, it's it's tricky. You know, in Canada, we're we're challenged with are, weather. We're challenged with infrastructure. Thing, right? like There's no question you know, about it. I was starting um, so in Thunder Bay as a bike rider. Of course, we didn't have Sunday shopping, right? So <clears> we would be in the parking lots of the local Canadian Tire Zellers with around, racing around uh, pylons, right, cones. And some of the, and still to this day, some of my, my, my best memories, some of the funnest times I had, you just parked in the parking lot and, you know, in the trunk of your car was your change room sort of thing. Um, you know, and again, we have to get creative. Alex, I want to take advantage of your time here. I know you got a sort of hard stop here. And I want to talk about something we sort of touched on at the top, and that is sort of what, how, how are we seeing or what are we seeing out there now with this appetite for more of a domestic racing scene not just even in canada but canada the us you know we used to have such great great events um you know like again i can't help but you know we had tour of alberta we you know we it, it, and we're just we're seeing this this struggle is is the future of cycling these big events do we need to continue to put these on or should we start exploring other avenues Well, sorry, I'll answer and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll sign off. But I think uh, it's 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 really hard to get to convince um, you know regional governments to to close roads for a bike race, whether it's a regional race, that, you know, a pro race. Um, you know, it's it's becoming harder and harder to get it to gain acceptance. Um, you know, as as we know, the business model of of professional cycling is 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 a tough one. Uh, it, no one really makes money from asking. putting on a bike race, um, you know, unless, uh, you know, yeah, 
Yeah, or, or, you know, I think Serge Arsenault does a good job in, in Quebec, uh, you know, in Montreal with, with the World Cups. But um, I, it's, it's, it's very, 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 very tough. Uh, so I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't have the answer. <laughs> <clears throat> we keep plugging away with, with um, what we can do at our club level. And yeah. uh, you know that's that's what I'm able to to uh, influence right now here here in Edmonton and well, um, I, you know help help yeah, where I can but uh, gonna, I don't have an answer have sorry see you go but uh, at that leave the call not you know leave this earth uh, but wanted to appreciate you know not first and foremost state up front appreciate all the efforts that you're doing at Edmonton um, you know again it's it, it, the event the Cycling Club is a, is a powerhouse in this country and still continues to churn out such such great uh, such great leaders. Um, and, you know, uh, thank you for taking your time today to, to join us on this call. Uh, we'll stick around a little bit longer. I know that everybody's got hard stops in and around there, so please feel free. We'll try to, we'll try to, you know, sort of roll this out, close this out, close this out a bit rolling. But I wanted to talk, I wanted to sort of bring up this idea of, like, the future of racing. And, again, during this particular time, Alex, tell me. Tell me. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'll just sign off right now, Kurt. Of, okay. Of, Good to see you guys. Look what's Thanks. going on in, with uh, sort of online bike racing, you know, the gaming of the sport. Uh, is there any traction there? You guys think that there's going to be – is there any validity to that in your minds? Leah? Yeah. Um, maybe – well, Mike, you've been on – I think you've been on Do you want to that? more than me, but – I guess from what I've seen, I I think that is going to be a part of the sport now, just with seeing how popular it's become in the last few months. Um, I don't think that will be the only kind of racing. I think we will we will go back to racing on the road, but um, it's hard to say that 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 won't also be an important part of the sport going forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's in many ways it could be it will be the future of parts of the sport. I think e-gaming is growing like crazy. Uh, virtual reality is is only getting better. Uh, when you look at how far gaming technology has come in the last 30 years, um, the virtual experience is only going to get better in the next 30 years. And uh, you look at the number of people. I was doing these with rides. The number of people online at at the same time uh, uh, is, is incredible, um, and uh, it's accessible racing in a lot of ways. Like all of a sudden, you don't have to deal with road closures, you don't have to deal with um, uh, safety issues. Uh, it, yeah, it, like I, I, I love racing, and I love being a being a road cyclist. And I, I don't think like I don't think I'd be as good of a Zwifter. Um, because I like the actual athletic ability of of uh, of racing outside, but who knows? You know, I could see yeah. in thirty I, years it being you know I, I, so I, good. One of the things that I, it will be hard to differentiate. Excited. I was the excited two. about two things when I retired from cycling. One was that I was going to be able to have a beer at lunch. You know, when you travel around Europe and everybody like everybody's sitting there at lunch and they're having a beer and I go, man, I don't hurry wait for the day that I could do that only recognize that after I had the beer, I would like by two o'clock, I was, I needed a nap. But the second one, <coughs> excuse me, was that I would never have to ride my bike indoors ever again, because the demand wouldn't be there, right? There would be no, I could ride myself into shape uh, in the spring season. You know, of course, online riding just changed, changed that. Indoor riding changed all that. But for me, the transformation was a program like Swift, and I'm not endorsing them, but it did. It transformed for me. Uh, the experience of riding inside. And to think that I was, when I was riding, and I was riding with a few thousand people from around the world inspired me, right? And, you know, of course, somebody would go zoom and, zoom and pass me, and, you know, I'd try to keep up. And, of course, I put my weight in properly. Uh, so, you know, oh. they, they would always go, go up the hills faster, but it was a personal, uh, personal thing. So I, it just is interesting. And, and Mike, you know, you and I, sort of, <laughs> go ahead. No, and my my wife is a perfect example of that as well. My wife my wife rides maybe once a month, but over this quarantine, 
um, I told her Child Zwift and she got on and she immediately fell in love with it. Uh, she enjoyed uh, the workout, she enjoyed the, the racing component, but also it yeah. did make it her understand cycling far greater in the sense of watts, in the sense of numbers. She didn't, she had no understanding of watts before. And all of a sudden now, like I'll come back from a ride, she's like, so what was your average power today? And she, she just knows the numbers now. And it, it, that's one thing that I really liked about Swift is how it made a lot of these uh, I'm, I'm, power I'm, profiles more accessible. I'm sort of missing his name. It was our, our triathlete, uh, Ironman triathlete, um, Lyle. Oh my gosh, I'm missing. But the guy, you know, trained. Lionel Seinel, thank you. Lionel uh, didn't ride his bike outside in preparation for the Ironman, whatever it was two years ago when he was. Lionel Sanders. Lionel so Sanders. He, he went out and did a 180 kilometer ride where he never really rode outside. It was, you know, it's 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 pretty crazy. I mean, again, you know, there's this common conversation about the bike handling aspect. You know, once we get all these super fit people out on the road, you know, then then you know, we're starting to see some challenges with with bike skill. But uh, you know, interestingly, like, would like, what are you know? Again, here we're talking about a very Eurocentric sport. This I this idea of you know, again, the Europeans they ride their bikes outside. Again, it's not hard to see why it's so beautiful and and, and all that sort of stuff. Like, what's the attitude of your teammates with riding inside? Are you know, are they embracing it? Are they saying this is only a short-lived thing? Like, what are your what are you getting a sense of from the Europeans? Uh, yeah, I think, no, I definitely have teammates who fully embraced it. Um, you know, I had, I had some teammates in France and Spain who were in the full lockdown, you know, for eight, I think eight weeks there. And so they fully were on Zwift the whole time. And we're so thankful that that was an option. And, um, yeah, our team has been doing some of the virtual racing. And I think some people are finding it really motivating to have that, that online competition. So yeah, I think it, it seems to be being it's being embraced by cyclists around the world. So and it is a like Mike said, it's um, a way to increase accessibility in the sport and connect people like they just couldn't before. So that's that's really good to see. We talked about this, you know, being webinar being an hour, and we're at the top of the hour now. Um, I I'm not sure if you guys have to to dart off. Uh, quickly or not. We did talk about offering opportunity for people to ask some questions and see what's going on. Um, uh, I think some of the conversation in the chat room has kind of taken on a life of its own, so won't, won't touch on that so much. But I have, an, uh, I have a question for you guys, and this is off topic a little bit, sort of maybe consistent with where we just were, but it's a bit of a step. What's your mindset going to be come September? Like, you know, at this time of the year, your guys are so used to just being so, you know, you're racing, you get all that race fitness. We know that you can't compensate for that in any other way. What's your mindset going to be come September? Uh, Lee, I'll, I want to start with you. I, I'll give you, I'll sort of plug on this one. Like what, like talk us, talk us through a little bit that idea of, you know, come September, your guys are hitting the ground racing. Yeah. Um, I mean, for, yeah, for, for everyone, it's it's changed our plans, and it is an interesting as an athlete, you know, adapting to the current situation since we are uh, typically people who like to plan a lot and, um, you know, have a, a schedule that we follow. So, you know, that's just all shifted to start in September now, and, yeah, typically you'd be kind of building up to Worlds, and then you'd be winding down. So... I guess mindset wise, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to stay adaptable and adjust my, my goals forward. Um, so, you know, just trying to have the same attitude towards racing and preparation that, that I would have, you know, now at this time of the year, but I just, it's just shifted by a few months. Um, I am curious what, what it's like to race, um, the spring classes are in the fall. Um, but I think it's good to just go in with an, an open mind to this this new situation and, you know, just be, yeah, like I said, it's, it's just trying to be adaptable to everything. I mean, would you be treating this as a, as if it would be the start of the season as you would any start of the season, just in a different, just it, it's effectively the, a time shift? 
Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's how I'm looking at it and how my, my team is trying to prepare. You know, we've just shifted all the periodization and preparations. Just, you know, you just push them forward. And that's, I think, just trying to work within the best, uh, creating the best scenario with the information that we have. What about you, Rusty? Yeah, I think um, uh, I'm on the same page as Leah. I'm operating as if it's going to happen. I have to operate as if it's going to happen. I've uh, set my goals, looked at the schedule, and figured this is probably how it's going to play out, and this is how I have to prepare for it. Talked to my coach about it, and this is this is the plan. Um, however, I had a good talk with uh, one of my teammates, Mitch Docker, uh, a few weeks ago, and he did bring up a good point that – People are talking as if this is going to be the start of the season, as if everyone has taken an off season. And I don't think that's going to be the case. I still think we have a, an expression in, in the world tour called Septemberitis. When you get a bad case of Septemberitis, you know, yeah. your season's done. You're just going to, you're going to pull out of races earlier. You're, you're going to go and you're going to be on a ride. You're going to pass by a bar and think, mm, maybe I'll stop for a couple beers instead. But I think that, uh, type of mentality will be prev will be existent still because no matter who you are in the world tour, uh, who, no matter who you are as a professional cyclist, there's chances are there's been a point in this period where you've questioned everything, and you've questioned whether like what you're doing, whether your teams will be around, uh, what contracts are going to be like in the future, what races are going to be like in the future, and that's going to take a, a mental toll. And I saw I think there's going to be a, a level of fatigue. That can't be underestimated going into that 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 first that first race. That's not going to be like at the start of any other season. It's not going to be like when you start mm -hmm. a, Did you think down under in Australia where everyone's just super cool excited again, to be out there. You're, you're pushing. Uh, people are going to be excited for bike yeah, racing. There's only so excitement much, might, I don't know. I, I love the different. feel of the wind in my hair. You know, I like that. I I I love that. But it, you know, it is. It just is this idea of of. You know, I, I don't know, that uncertainty in that. I that's because you drag, that's because you have that great hair. You've got to have, <laughs> you play a, 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 put some stress on a person and, and maybe undo stress in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that we or they haven't experienced before. I mean, again, I'm just a, I'm just an observer who's loving, you know, the, the gravel roads, but it's just, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, I'm going to shut, I, again, just, just out of the sake of your time. Uh, totally. Really appreciated both of you, and of course with Alex Dita joining us on this first episode. Uh, this will be available totally. online for people to to watch. Um, on behalf of Cycling Canada and uh, our, our our supporter of this this uh, webinar, Apex, uh, really appreciated you guys taking your time. Um, I'm, I, I you know schedules are what they are, but as you just talked about yourself, Michael, it's it's uh, you just did a pod, a podcast just before this, so. And there's a lot of demands, but uh, a lot of great information out of this conversation. And I think I speak on behalf of all Canadians and uh, sort of wishing you guys the best uh, and most awesome 2020 season uh, that, that it could bring. We didn't touch on some things. I'm sure some people would have liked to have heard. Uh, but thank us, thank you for walking uh, walking us through this this program. And thank you to everybody for signing in and and having your healthy conversation as well uh, and, pro and providing some great feedback uh, in the chat rooms. So on, again, on behalf of Cycling Canada, everybody, uh, have a great day. Great, thank you.